Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we have another where is video and it's another case of a missing infant. I have covered two stories about missing infants in the past. Carolina White, who was taken from the hospital really young and years later when she was an adult, she found out that she was taken. I will link that video below. And then there's also Sabrina Eisenberg, which I get messages about Sabrina all the time. You guys have asked me so many times for an update on that case and I sadly do not have one. Trust me, it drives me just as crazy. Sabrina was taken right out of her crib, out of her house, and it was really weird, and the parents were accused for a long time. Uh, it's really similar to the story we're going to be talking about today. And in the Sabrina video, I talked about this girl who thought that she might be Sabrina and how they were gonna do her DNA, and we were supposed to find out. I never heard anything, so I'm guessing no news is not good news. Like. I'm guessing it wasn't her. But anyway, today we are talking about Lisa Irwin, who's another missing infant and another just strange case that is going to leave you with so many questions, way more than answers. Before we get started talking about Lisa's story, I wanted to let you guys know we do have another Thorn campaign this month. If you are new to my channel, every time I do a where is or missing persons video, I run a campaign to raise money for Thorn as well, which is an organization that was started by Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher to help save children from really bad situations. Basically, like the, the, the purchase and the commerce for human trafficking is happening online, just like everything else sure. now. And so we're building digital tools to fight back against it. And we have built a tool to help law enforcement prioritize their caseload and recover victims and, and, uh, and find uh, traffickers. Found and we've identified and recovered over 6,000 wow, uh, trafficking awesome. victims this year. So if you didn't hear, I now have three different ways that you can donate to Thorn. You can purchase one of our subscriber designed shirts, which by the way, I really need some new fresh designs. If you are a designer and you wanna be featured in one of these campaigns and get a chance to have your design on a shirt, check out the link below and literally anything Thing. like get creative with it it can be thorn related it could be related to my channel or it could just be something that you come up with so this is the thorn design for this month really really cool it's another one that says thorn on it which it seems like you guys really like the ones that actually say thorn and our artist today is named Lauren her information will be linked below this shirt is limited edition and only available for three weeks not only that you can also buy a thorn shirt right through them and they now are tracking everything that you guys spend on their website as well so we can put it into our where's campaign grand total and I also have a donation link where you can send any amount that you want and not only that I have one more permanent collection shirt that's always available on my website 365 days a year and 100% of the money from that goes to Thorn as well all right now let's go ahead and get into the case of baby Lisa Irwin. Lisa Renee Irwin was born on November 11th, 2010 in Independence, Missouri, and her parents are named Deborah or Debbie Bradley and Jeremy Irwin. Debbie and Jeremy had both been married before and they both had a child with their previous partner. So Lisa also had two half brothers and the Irwin family was just your average American family. When Debbie found out that she was pregnant, she was absolutely thrilled that she was having another baby and they could not wait to meet their daughter. She was really excited to be having a little girl. And when she was born, they ended up naming her Lisa. They named her Lisa after Debbie's mom. Lisa was super sweet and the whole family just absolutely loved her. Debbie describes this time in their lives to just be absolutely picture perfect. So fast forward a little bit to October 3rd, 2011. That day, Lisa's father got home at 2.30 p.m. and he got home from his job as an electrician at random times. Sometimes he worked late at night or even overnight and sometimes he worked in the middle of the day. So it really just varied. And so he was home that day at 2.30 and he had lunch with his kids. A few hours later, Debbie and her brother, Philip went to the grocery store around 4 30 p.m. They're seen on surveillance video, in fact, purchasing baby food, baby wipes, and a box of wine. And Jeremy stayed home with the kids while they were out. Debbie's brother came back to her house with her. They brought the groceries in and he left around 5 30. So then Debbie prepared dinner like normal for herself and the kids because Jeremy was actually going back out to work the night shift at his job, which like I said, was common. And this time he was going to be working on the electricity at a Starbucks. And this was actually one of the first 
first night shifts that he had done in quite a while. Um, he normally didn't do them. And so Debbie was kind of nervous about being home alone, which I totally understand. I hate being home alone. <laughs> but it was kind of nice because he was gonna be earning like overtime money for this. So she figured, you know, it's kind of worth it. And he decided to do it. So Jeremy took off for his night shift and he told Debbie that he would be home around 10 p.m. So not even that late. Um, but Debbie thought she would be a lot more comfortable and enjoy her night a little more if she invited one of the neighbor friends to come over. So right as Jeremy left, Debbie put Lisa in her pajamas, did her night routine and put her in her crib, tucked her in and sent her off to bed. Now, when you put your baby in your crib, you are thinking that they're going to be fine, that they're gonna be safe in there. So they put on a movie for the kids and the two of them were drinking a few glasses of wine. They sat outside on the porch while they were hanging out, while the kids were inside. But Debbie said that she checked on the kids several different times. So the boys ended up saying that they were getting tired around 10 p.m. So she decided to call it a night with her neighbor friend. She went home and then Debbie went inside and put the older kids to bed around 10.30. After that, she checked on Lisa one more time before going to bed and then went to bed herself. Now, Jeremy ended up having way more to do at the Starbucks than he realized. So he got home at 4 a.m., which is way later than what he originally thought. So the first thing that Jeremy noticed when he got in the house was that the door was unlocked. He thought this was unusual and a little worrisome, but didn't freak out or anything. So he went inside the house. Another thing that he thought was weird was a lot of the lights were on in the house, which was weird because it was the middle of the night. It never seemed like the house was shut down properly. So he first went and checked on his wife in their room and Debbie was passed out on the bed along with her son. One of the sons had crawled in bed with her. And this is so weird, but there was a random stray cat at the bottom of the bed just chilling as well. So he walked down the hall, checked on his other son and he was asleep in the bottom bunk. So all good there. After this, he went and checked on Lisa and that is when he noticed that she was not in her crib. Now, can you imagine the freak out moment? So he runs out of Lisa's room, goes to tell Debbie what's happening. He frantically wakes her up and starts asking, you know, where's Lisa? She's not in her crib. And she says she has no idea where she is. So then they all get up and start frantically looking through the house, ripping the house apart, trying to find Lisa. They figured maybe she wasn't put in her crib or something and crawled away or she was somewhere hiding in the house. That was their first thought. Jeremy ran outside of the house. He ran to the neighbor's house thinking that maybe it was possible that Debbie was confused and like left Lisa over at the neighbor's house, even though they weren't even there. But I mean, that was his thinking at that point. I mean, it's four in the morning. He has no idea what was happening that night. But Debbie said the last time that she saw her, she was in her crib asleep. So they were looking all through the house. And when they were looking, they noticed that a screen was messed up in one of their offices. And they normally left their screen windows open to, you know, get air into the house. But this was unusual because the screen looked like it was tampered with or kind of broken. So they they started to think that maybe someone broke into their house through the screen. And this is when they started to think maybe someone actually broke into the house and took Lisa. So Jeremy ran to call 911, but when he got to their phones where they normally had them all plugged in, his phone and Debbie's phone were gone. Luckily he had his work phone on him. So he was able to use that to call 911. So police got there very quick. They immediately started searching for Lisa and they found absolutely no trace of her. So they started looking outside of the house in the rest of the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods, doing interviews with people, trying to see if anyone has seen a baby. Soon the local news media was reporting that she was missing and people started to freak out. I mean, anytime a baby goes missing, it's just, I mean, really freaky, especially when it seems like someone could have broken into the parent's house. The National Guard was also brought in to look for Lisa. So they really were not messing around. Literally thousands of people showed up to help in the search for Lisa. The family lived kind of close to the Missouri River. So they searched that, but didn't find anything. And obviously, you know, the clock is really ticking in a situation like this. The longer you don't find someone, especially a child, the less likely they are to return home. So they did not find her within the first 24 hours. And that was, you know, obviously a major upset to the police and to her parents and everyone involved. So the next day they held a press conference and they allowed Debbie and Jeremy to make a public statement. Anybody that might have her, uh, we can drop her off at a, any place safe, fire station, or hospital, or a church. No questions asked. We just want to have her back home. We just want our home. baby back. Please, bring her home. 
Our two other boys are waiting for her, please. I was completely beside myself. My daughter's missing. I don't know where she is. I don't know who took her. I don't know if she's safe. Debbie and Jeremy were actually really cooperative with law enforcement at first, and they had no problem providing them with access to their home, computers. They were like, you know, anything to help the situation. Doors open, there is no limit. Police requested to meet with their two sons in private, and they agreed. Being the last one who saw her and the one that was home alone with her makes Debbie, you know, automatically a suspect. So police ended up interrogating her for almost 12 hours. And this is when Debbie said they started accusing her of doing something to Lisa. And Debbie was really upset, not because she was being accused, but because according to her, she knew that she was not the one to take Lisa and she felt like they were wasting their time by focusing on her. Jeremy, however, was cleared because he was able to provide an alibi for where he was that night. He was at work and there's film footage of him at work. So he was in the clear, but Debbie, obviously there's no footage of her and she was not in the clear. Debbie was also being looked at because she was drinking that night. And Debbie changed her story quite a bit actually. At first she said she only had one or two glasses and then it turned into a couple and then it turned into maybe almost 10. So her story was being altered a little bit, which definitely raises red flags. But I think she was initially scared that if she told them how much she was drinking, she would automatically be blamed and you know, no one wants to be blamed for something like this. So the police ended up taking a look at that window that had the messed up screen and they tried to reenact someone coming through the window to see if there was a way that, you know, this was actually a possible scenario. But police ultimately came to the conclusion that no one could have come through the window because the window was just too high and it was impossible for them to do it. But it's kind of weird because it was a one story house. So I don't really understand their logic with that. And there was also untouched dust on the windowsill. So they came to the conclusion that no one would have been able to break in without leaving a mark on that dust. So because of this, police really started to believe that no one broke into the house and that Debbie was guilty. Now this seems so ridiculous to me because let's all not forget, when Jeremy came home, the door was unlocked. So someone could have just walked in the house that way. They didn't even have to go through a window. So it really didn't prove anything. We don't know if that door was somehow unlocked by someone or they broke in and then went out through the front door or if Debbie just straight up forgot to lock the door because she was drinking that night. And maybe someone just decided to try to open it and it worked. Maybe someone noticed that the truck wasn't in the driveway and knew that she was home alone and just came in. She was also drinking outside on the porch. So someone could have easily known what was going on that night, that she was home alone and that she was drinking with three kids at home. So another thing that was weird was Debbie also changed her story about when she last saw Lisa. At first she said that she saw her around 10.30 p.m. right before she went to bed herself, but then she admitted that she actually saw her at 6.30, which is pretty much when Jeremy left for work. So because of this, police started to look more into Debbie and honestly, fair enough, it does look pretty weird. I don't get those types of vibes from Debbie. She doesn't seem like the type of person that would do something like that, but you'd be surprised with killers. So you never really know. And the police definitely had every right to be concerned. They offered Debbie a polygraph test and she decided to go ahead and take it. And she was confident that she was going to pass it, but she ended up not passing the polygraph test, which is kind of understandable because it is pretty stressful to go through that type of situation. Like I think I'd probably be pretty nervous during a polygraph test, even if I had nothing to hide. I think just being hooked up to that machine is stressful and being questioned and polygraph tests you know, are said to be accurate sometimes, but you definitely can't like completely rely on one. So after the test, the FBI agent really started shaming Debbie and telling her she was guilty and that she was a bad mom. Now, obviously this was really upsetting to Debbie and this is when they completely decided to stop working with the police. But earlier the mother and father decided to quit cooperating with the police, but our door is always open. New developments tonight in the search for missing baby Lisa Irwin. Her parents are no longer cooperating with police. For three days, police flooded this Northland neighborhood. Officers combing out in search of 10-month-old Lisa Irwin and neighbors praying for her safe return. All along, police said Lisa's parents, Jeremy Irwin and Deborah Bradley, cooperated with police until Thursday night. They've always been uh, free. They've been cooperative up to this point, but early this evening, they decided to stop cooperating with detectives. Just an hour before this press conference, Channel 9 was there as Jeremy Irwin left KCPD headquarters with a family member. I don't get it because as a parent myself, if my child was missing, I would give anything I have. I mean, the police are the ones that are, are your friends. They're going to 
help find your child. So at this point, I don't know what to think. I don't know if you guys knew this, but it is actually legal for the FBI to lie to someone and tell them that they didn't pass a polygraph test when they actually did. So we really don't know if she passed it or not. Since Debbie and Jeremy decided to stop working with the police, the police started to assume that Lisa was no longer alive. On October 19th, they decided to bring in a cadaver dog to search their house. So during the search, the cadaver dog found a spot next to the parents' bed where they picked up a scent. When it comes to the cadaver dogs, it really depends on who you talk to. Different people have different opinions on just how much you should rely on them and whether or not the evidence should be taken seriously. So the problem with cadaver dogs is they have such a good sense of smell that they're often not wrong, but they can get false positives very easily. So it could have been even a diaper spill from Lisa or something else that they were detecting on the floor. So once the public found out about the cadaver dogs and the police starting to have distrust of them and saying things, you know, like they're not working with us. You know, people are naturally starting to think maybe the parents are not so innocent here. Maybe Debbie really did something and maybe she did. Who really knows? At this point, it had been almost a month since Lisa first went missing and there were still no answers as to where she went. So they put up a $100,000 reward for anyone that could help bring Lisa home. And on October 23rd, they held a vigil for Lisa. We love you, Orwin family. We love people were just devastated i mean this beautiful baby girl just gone just completely gone so eventually police did find another possible suspect which is good so this is crazy but the night that lisa went missing there were several different sightings of a man holding a baby the first sighting was actually up the street that night and there was a man who was leaving his house in the middle of the night to go to work he had like a night shift or something and he noticed a man carrying a baby and that the baby was underdressed which could have been lisa because obviously a baby if they're in their crib is not dressed as they should be for being outside. And it's October, so it's a strange time to have an underdressed baby just outside with a man in the middle of the night. He thought this was weird, but you know, didn't think too much of it until he realized that there was a baby that went missing, and that's when he decided to report this. And another super strange thing is the night that Lisa went missing, there was a dumpster fire down the street, and it was reported, and when police got there to this dumpster fire, they actually found baby clothes inside of the dumpster. And they also saw a man on this gas station footage. The gas station cameras were filming like across the street and this man, there's like a, you know, a forest, a really dense forest. And this dude just like comes walking out of it in the middle of the night. So that seems sketched to police. So they noted that. Then there was also a second sighting of a man holding a baby. A motorcyclist was just getting off of work a night shift in the middle of the night and was headed home when he saw a man just walking down the street with a baby. Now what's weird is this man has the exact same description as the other person described seeing the man with the baby near the Irwin's house. He said the baby was underdressed and he claims that he pulled over and told the man that he needed to put the baby in a blanket and offered to help, but the guy refused. He even offered to give him a ride, but the guy said no and so the motorcyclist hopped on his motorcycle and headed away and then shortly after that he found out that a baby had gone missing and that's when he also decided to call the police so the police continued their investigation with this new information and that is when they came across this homeless man named Jersey Jersey is actually someone who is known for hanging around the similar areas of town that the Irwins lived in and this man's real name is actually John Tanko he's pretty well known to law enforcement and has had a history of committing crimes one of the main crimes that he committed was breaking into people's second vacation homes and living in them for periods of time or stealing from them. And this one guy who had his house broken into by Jersey said that he went through the window and that's how he breaks into houses is by going into windows. This is 42 year old John Tanko, better known as Jersey, a handyman who worked around the Northland neighborhood near the Irwin home. Tanko was in court today on charges not related to the baby Lisa case. But early on in the investigation, we know police were anxious to find Tanko 
Tico and question him about the night Lisa disappeared. Tico's not a problem. There, Aka Ezria lives just a block up on North Lister from the Irwin home. Two months ago, two months ago. He says he called the cops on Tanko two or three times, claiming he was breaking into his neighbor's house across the street. All the while, the homeowner was living out of state. And we chased him one time over here. And, but he never lived here. There said Tanko would break into the house through a window, which could be what had investigators looking to find him. We know a window in the Irwin home was open. The screen pushed in the night Lisa vanished. According to court documents, Tanko even went as far as to list this home as his home address on court papers. It was also discovered that the night that Lisa went missing, Jersey was only a few minutes down from their house. So the theory started forming that maybe Jersey was watching the house from afar for a while. He waited until Jeremy's work truck was gone and then went ahead and made his move. Maybe he figured that would be a good time to break into the house and that she was probably alone. It's possible that he walked into the house and he was planning on just robbing them but decided to take Lisa instead. And this seems kind of likely because Debbie was pretty drunk and sleeping. You know, when you're drunk and sleeping, you're pretty passed out. So the chances of her having actually heard someone break into her house or even just open the door since it was unlocked is really slim. But even more damning, they found that one of the missing cell phones was used to call this girl named Megan, who is actually one of Jersey's girlfriends. So Megan was brought in for questioning and she told police that she had actually told Jersey that she really wanted a baby. And she thought maybe Jersey could have taken Lisa as some type of baby for her as like a gift to win her over again because they've been like kind of on and off in their relationship. The people that described seeing a man with a baby all described a skinny, tall, white man, which definitely matches Jersey. In addition, he was also known for having an obsession with fire, which kind of makes sense. Maybe he burned her clothes. So because of this, police arrested him and brought him in for questioning. So Jersey denies any involvement. And so they ended up bringing him in and putting him like with a group of people and having witnesses come in and try to identify him. And some of them said that he looked like the guy that they saw, but some of them said that he didn't. And so because of this inconsistency, they ended up having no choice but to let Jersey go, which seems really crazy to me because I feel like there's a good chance it really could have been him. So then there was kind of a break in the case in October of 2013. There was a little girl who was discovered in Greece whose background was unknown. The people who were claiming to be this little girl's parents weren't actually her parents, and her DNA didn't show any results in the missing children's database in Greece. Developments in that mystery child found in Greece. We're just happy that um, there's a little girl that's going to be returned to her family, and their nightmare will end. Um, and it gives us even more hope than we already have. Um, I have immense hope that my daughter is not only okay, but she's going to come home. We started um, doing comparison pictures side by side on the computer, and um, we, we went ahead and just focused on Lisa's face instead of her hair color. And that's when we started to notice the, the resemblance. Look at the child found in Greece called Maria. Compare her photo to the age progression photo of what a nearly three-year-old baby Lisa would look like. The couple she was with is now behind bars. I don't know for sure, but just the fact that we don't know for sure is enough, no matter what. Once Debbie and Jeremy heard about this little girl, they contacted the Greek authorities because they believed that this could be Lisa. Because the girl did look really similar to the age progression photos of Lisa. However, the girl's age was estimated to be between four and six, and Lisa would have only been three at this time. So unfortunately, after doing multiple rounds of DNA testing, they determined that this baby was not Lisa. They have never given up on her since. They believe that she is still out there. They actually believe that she's alive. They just hope that she isn't suffering or being hurt in any way. You know, they think that it could have been some type of illegal adoption, which you know we've talked about for Timothy Pitson, we talked about for Sabrina Eisenberg. Throughout the years, Lisa's family has continued to hold vigils for her. It's just incredibly sad seeing their pain. They still wrap her presents for her birthday and Christmas as if she's still there, and they've never really gotten over this. To me, Debbie doesn't really seem like someone who would kill her own baby, and I feel like it would have been pretty hard for her to do considering she did have an alibi. She was with someone that night. She was drinking. Like, how well can she pull off the murder of her own baby. Like there'd be some evidence. She's not like this crazy mastermind criminal that could get away with something like this. I just think the chances of it being her are really slim. 
I don't know. I like to think I have a good judge of character and she just doesn't strike me as someone who killed their baby. Over the years, several different age progression photos have come out and the most recent one came out a little over a year ago. Lisa's parents think that this picture is actually the most important so far because of the fact that Lisa is now at the age where she would be attending school, which means the likelihood of someone seeing her is a lot greater. This is the same way that the Eisenbergs felt that, you know, maybe eventually Sabrina would just show up because she's getting older and would be in school and stuff. But these people could be being homeschooled. They could be in some type of strange community or cult. It's hard, but it does make you think that if it is some type of illegal adoption, that maybe they'll eventually show up. There have been cases of babies being taken and then reunited way later on. Carolina White is one of those babies. She was taken right out of the hospital. And then she discovered that she was actually adopted later on on her own. I really want to know what you guys think of this case. Do you think that Lisa is still out there? Do you think that this was an illegal abduction? Do you think she could have possibly even been brought into human trafficking, which is kind of my concern. And again, why organizations like Thorn are so important. And you should definitely check out the shirts in the description box or the donation link to see how you can give back to Thorn because it's really such a cool thing to be giving your money towards. Saving children that are in human trafficking is pretty awesome. But that's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a good one. Stay safe and I will talk to you in my next video. Where'd you go?